Hey guys, what's up? It is week 188, and let you guys know, well, at the 22 shots, we recorded episode 200. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It was a surprise. Um, it was so, it was like a nine hour recording. We started at 7.30 and we didn't get done till five in the morning. It was crazy. Um, just, if, you, if you're into the show, check it out. I think that it's a pretty cool show, actually. I'll talk about it a little bit more next week after it's been up and everything like that. So, yeah. Let's hop into the first review. And this first one is from Mondo Macabro. And this is Seven Women for Satan. And I had heard about this one, this French movie. Um, but I had never had a chance to check it out. So, right when I put this in, it just started off really awesome. It had some great music. Uh, it was like the score was just uh, engaging, very pulse pounding. And we have this guy on horseback chasing this naked woman through the, the woods. And I was like... Oh boy, this is something else. Uh, early, I think this is early '70s. Maybe, maybe even definitely '70s. I, I'm mistaking if it's. It might be latter '70s. But it, even even to open your movie like that in the '70s, I was like, this is pretty intense. So, anyways, he knocks the woman off a cliff, and then uh, we cut to him being kind of shaken out of a daydream, and he's fantasizing about it. That's kind of his fantasy, and uh, somebody's telling him, "Wake up!" And then you're like, "Oh, this guy has this dark underbelly under this nice kind of you know pristine like kind of." Business business kind of guy deal so he starts to leave his office and we have these two guys discussing with each other and they say that man right there comes from a lineage of a, you know an awful person who used to torture people at his castle and he has grown so far in society that he can hide his disgusting behavior um, to the point where we can't see it on the outside and that, that right away kind of sums up you know def basically the point of the movie or just the statement they're making <clears throat> anyways and then we cut to him kind of going to his isolated mansion where he has secretaries come and he has a helper in Howard Vernon who is basically like seems to be his family lineage is tied in with his like his father was a servant to his father and before and before so they have this weird entanglement and um, something almost supernatural is going on as well where um, he feels like he can't escape from it and um, the lead here is obsessed with a past love and everything like that so um, people keep wandering to the castle as they do in these gothic settings they just are drawn to you know like a moth to a flame uh, so basically they end up here and uh, there is uh, some torture of course and sexual weird uh, kind of things going on but uh, my favorite scene in the whole movie that just uh, was really great was this couple ends up their car breaking down and they show up um, to the room the castle and um, the girl's very excited because they just walked five miles and they finally get some rest so she runs she's in the room she's dancing just like just the 70s dance and then she looks out the window and she sees a dead naked woman she's like oh my god and her husband runs over they look out the window together she's gone she's like she's like she's like there that was there i know and then she just starts dancing and then she looks back out the window and sees howard Vernon carrying the body away and she's like ah and i was like this has to be played for comedy beats because it's too damn funny and clever not to be but uh yeah i really enjoyed that but it gets really kind of crazy um like i said highly sexualized very you know nudity filled and definitely some obvious obvious sadistic tendencies by the lead guy here and he um indulges in those so um i thought this was a pretty solid kind of crazy exploitation movie this is the elongated version or the extended version which was i believe cut in in uh, france at first there is an interview with uh the lead actor in here he talks a little bit about working with jess franco talking about how he's making three movies at once vlog here and that and there's also uh an interview with the director which is about an hour long so if you've ever seen seven uh women for satan and you enjoy it it's it's a nice looking disc they cleaned it up it looks really good it looks top notch sounds top notch and it actually uh, i enjoyed it i thought it was a pretty good movie that's seven women for satan okay we're gonna have some quick ones from 2020 i don't want to spoil too much so it's kind of hard to talk about these but this first one was on hulu and it is bad hair and somebody told me my moods was talking said basically is this a he's like is this a remake of hair extensions by the sano um so i don't know uh cyan sano I'm not 100% sure because I haven't watched Hair Extensions yet. So I put this one in, and, and literally this one feels a lot like a Tales from the Crypt episode, and I've seen the comparison. Um, but I do want to say that it has a little bit more of, you know, a social message in it for sure. 
Uh, this takes place in the 70s, and it's kind of when, like, they were doing, like, the uh, hair extensions. They were doing it more... I don't know shit about hair, okay? Uh, especially women's hair. So, like, I, I don't know the details about beauty tips and stuff like that when they were, you know, originated and when they became popular. But this is definitely making a statement um, on, on a lot of that stuff. And obviously the African-American stuff with it in there too. So we have this woman who is kind of like an assistant to somebody who runs this network that focuses on black entertainment. They have segments and everything like that. I don't know if it's a news station or a, I think it's a video kind of show deal. So they um, kind of focus on a lot of black oriented stuff. Um, one day they decide to sell the company and oh geez who is it? it's Vanessa Williams I think comes in um, and she's running the show now and she wants to change things around and she basically tells this assistant um, she likes some of her ideas she says but you know do you have somebody that does your hair and she says who does your hair she says I do it myself well get your hair done you know basically kind of forcing her to conform to this different new look these hair extensions kind of almost like um, uh, taking away a lot of their culture and pushing this whole new culture on them, you know, and I don't want to say like basically making everybody more white or less black or less, you know, ethnic and stuff like that so they can fit in. But of course, this comes with a dangerous side effect. These hairs come directly from India and uh, there's this evil curse. And she learns of this kind of curse uh, or possibly what's happening through her um, uncle who uh, teaches history and everything like that and there's this old tale about uh, somebody taking this moss and stuff from a tree and putting it in their hair and it's not exactly what they think it is. They look gorgeous but at the same time mm, you know there's something in there. So basically it, it's kind of a story we've seen before um, like body parts or body bags or um, you know when you get something new that are uh, different uh, attachment to you it starts to change you and control you but there's lots of cool stuff going on here it's shot in 16 millimeter which is a plus the acting solid it has a really high body count that i didn't think was going to go there um higher than you would think after a while um i dig it it's pretty cool man uh bad hair highly recommended uh like i said good soundtracks uh, good I, I mean like the music's all done really well it looks visually great, so it just seems very professional, very well acted, and it feels like an hour and a half Tales in the Crypt episode, a good one, a very good one that has some, you know, cultural stuff in there. So, boom, bad hair, good movie, check it out. Okay, another one from 2020 is His House from Netflix. Uh, yeah, I checked this one out, and it's pretty damn unique. It is kind of a ghost story in a lot of ways, but when you kind of add this different, like I said, like cultural kind of uh, difference in there and inject it into a movie, I'm more intrigued. Like, well, I'm uh, thinking of Satan's Slave, or terrified. It's just different. It's just not the same typical stuff I've seen a million times of spooky house, um, the American kind of stuff like that. Um, I just feel like Americans don't do ghost stories the best. I think every other country does it better. I know I'm going to get shit for it. The Changeling's an amazing movie, even though I think that's Canadian. Americans just are, you know, I don't love a lot of their more modern ghost stories. They just never intrigued me. But we have his house here. We have these refugees coming from a country. Um, which one is it? It's in Africa, and it's um, they're trying to escape of course and they come over on a boat with their um, uh, husband wife and a daughter and the daughter is lost they're kind of staying in this uh, kind of partial facility where you know they have not earned their you know citizenship at all and they've not yeah kind of, I guess they're being vetted or something like that but a lot of people sit in here for a long period of time they end up getting this house it's kind of run down but it's better than what they had back home it's huge and they're kind of confused why it's so big just for them and at first they have to adapt, but they have that, you know, the void within them because what they've lost and it's just really sad and depressing. The male at first starts to, the husband starts to kind of um, adapt a little bit better, but um, there's something definitely going on in the house and they start to see visions that haunt them from their past. And it seems that this haunted past is leaking into their world through the house or through something that has followed them um, from their country. But um, some great visuals here, including um, some of that um, horrible, horrible boat ride that they took coming into the house and these kind of almost like super Fulci like zombie demon things coming in um, so visually there's lots of great stuff and there's a couple really poignant moments in here um, that show uh, a side that a lot of people don't like to explore um, yes people hate refugees and things like that a lot of people do in countries they don't want them there they think they're you know dangerous whatever it is there's definitely some alienation towards refugees no matter what country you're in or no matter where you're from so anyways like that but um, a lot of people don't like to suggest that there is um, racism within certain groups and everything like that so 
or it's just something you don't see typically. You would see there's these young African American um, uh, boys that are um, in in the UK, and they're British, of course. And she asked them for directions. She's got a very thick accent, of course. Um, it always cracks me up when people make fun of people with thick accents, and they're like, "This is like their third, fourth language, and you can only barely speak English half the time." So you're making fun of them for being able to speak like their fourth language or something. Uh, but you know, a anyways, um, so they start to give her a hard time, and you're just like, "Ah, oh, there's this hate within all these different groups of people," and it's just so many times in movies you see it's just your basic white redneck hating on a gay person or an African American, but there's all these different divisions of hatred and um, it's just a little bit uh, refreshing to see it done in a different way, although it's very kind of disturbing and sad. But anyways, this one's not super graphic, although some of the scares are pretty hardcore, where I was like, that's pretty gnarly, that's pretty uh, um, and, and scary. Um, but uh, there is a reveal here that is pretty gut-wrenching. Um, and I think it's just like, oh, wow, that's pretty rough. Anyways, really like this one. Good movie. His House. Highly recommended. Um, check it out for sure. I, I think most people will like it. And I like that there's all these holes in the walls in the house because that's a great place to put scares in when you're looking at a hole in the wall. And there's nothing scarier than looking at the freaking wall. And all of a sudden, there's an eye in a hole in the wall. And you're like, what? It's terrifying to me. Um, I know, I know. Obviously, people under the stairs, but the canal did that really well. Just like when you kind of stare into a hole in a wall or something, and there's something in there, and it's it's just kind of scary. Okay, the next 2020 is from on a Shutter exclusive here, and this is called Anything for Jackson. And this one kind of popped up, and uh, a couple people were talking about how good it was. So I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a, give it a shot. Um, who's the guy in here? Julian Richings. That's the guy who I recognize. He's in a slew of stuff. Very very gaunt face, skinny guy. Very very kind of memorable. So basically what we have here is this uh, pair of grandparents. They were grandparents, um, older couple, and they, they're they trying, to, it's a reverse exorcism. They're trying to bring back their grand um, son, I believe it is, Jackson, of course. So um, right in the beginning, they kidnap this pregnant woman and they tie her up and they, they don't seem like they want to do these awful things, but they're just anything for Jackson, like the title would suggest. And it turns out that he is a doctor, and we start to see more about his life and everything like that. And um, they're performing these rituals with a very old book. They're part of a satanic group, which involves this crazy, weird-looking guy who reminded me of a character that Henry Zabrowski would play on the last podcast on the left, but I loved him in the movie. He's super weird expert on the occult and uh, all that kind of stuff, the Book of the Dead, all that kind of shit is what I assume this this book they have is some sort of Necronomicon but uh, so they start to look into it and they're looking for a way to bring Jackson into this unborn baby um, there's some a lot of beats of comedy um, in here there's a minimal cast minimal locations um, very well acted um, and, and a lot of good reoccurring humor that happens although it's dark it's dark as hell um, but I really like this one and it's due to the cast and the way it unfolds. And I was so totally ready to be done with exorcist movies. But this isn't. This is a reverse exorcism movie. And I like these movies where the gates of hell, or it's not the gates of hell, but some sort of evil force is opened where you can do whatever the hell you want without much explanation. And it makes sense. So when they open this gate or when they off, offer to bring this demon in, they're not obviously <laughs> experts on the subject. So they invite lots of weird things into their home. Uh, so yeah, great visuals as well. Good visual scares, different things, some good gore, um, and a, and a dark movie, although comedic at times. Anything for Jackson, another another gem of this year. So yeah, check it out. It's on Shutter. Speaking of gems of the year, um, this one I was like, this is gonna be in my top ten. Just hearing about it, like I just like basically you ever have those movies? You're like, oh, it's gotta be right. Like it's so up my alley. It sounds perfect for me. Um, and this is Brandon Cronenberg's uh, The Possessor. Yeah. <laughs> so boy. Um, this movie is pretty nuts. Uh, obviously, Brandon Cronenberg's the son of David Cronenberg, and body horror is the name of the game, right? Um, this is, I feel, uh, futuristic, slightly, possibly, but it's a science fiction horror film. And in this world, uh, Possessor, okay, you can um, body hop to a certain extent. It's kind of a, a more complicated procedure. You, you body jump into somebody and they use you uh, to kill somebody else. But the main person who's involved in this uh, experiment is more so um, has to kind of adapt and learn the characters, kind of like Dark Man, how he's learning everybody's voice. She kind of learns and kind of adapts to them. But at times, doing this too many times, you can become, 
obviously can mess your brain up, jump, body jumping and sending your, you know, your your mental state into somebody else and controlling it. It's just a very complicated procedure. So we have these, uh, basically it follows this one woman who's been doing this for a living. And it opens up with a gnarly assassination. Don't want to give too much away. But that suggests a lot of things within here. Um, that uh, basically, I, I, I don't want to give anything away about the psychological nature of any of the characters in the movie because I think that stuff is the most interesting. And I think that the duality of life that this character is living is also one of the most interesting parts of it. So I basically, I got to go over some of the visuals and stuff like that. Visually, it, it looks really good. Um, it's really well acted. Um, it does kind of slow down a bit at times, but the payoff is 110% worth it. And it's so dark that I was like, oh boy. And, and there's little differences in lines that at first you hear the character talk in the beginning about something. And then you hear them talk about the same thing at the end. And um, they don't mention this one thing at the very end. And you would suggest that it is kind of changing them in little details um, over time. And you can definitely tell that, um, that I don't like I said I really don't want to spoil this for anybody so I'm trying to keep it as vague as possible maybe I'll do a little spoiler thing at the end like I did with Invisible Man but uh, like I said super gory Sean Bean is in here love Sean Bean um, it goes places that a lot of bigger movies wouldn't this one played in theaters there's full frontal male and female nudity and it definitely feels like a futuristic society to a certain extent like THX at times these people are just sitting there looking at everybody's freaking lampshade in, in kind of a droned out state so there's all that kind of going for it but um, anyways, highly recommended, super violent, super dark, the ending will um, uh, kill your sorry shit in the lamest terms. Um, so let's get into some spoilers here. So I really like the idea that she might be losing her humanity by doing this too many times. That, Or she might have always enjoyed killing in the first place. That's why she decides to use a knife in the opening of the film instead of the gun, right? And by the end of the movie, her murders are carried out in a more brutal fashion. The beginning of the movie, they ask her um, about these items after she gets out of the the, the psychological or whatever the, the the assassination attempt. They ask her if she remembers, and she says, "Yeah, I remember that. I got that butterfly and I, fr I I put it in this little frame and everything. Felt bad about it. Still feel bad about it." And later on, when she does it, she says, "Yes, I remember." She doesn't mention about feeling bad, so it's like she's losing her her. Um, oop, sorry about that. She's losing her you know, her compass or her, her sympathy, her empathy or whatever you want to say, her conscience. And, uh, just and like she finally chooses kind of in a certain way and the duality of her life here. But anyways, just, just a really crazy movie, really violent. I'm definitely going to rewatch it to feel, uh, to find out where it does land in my top 10 because it's got to be there just how well made it is and everything and different and brutal. So yeah. Um, possessor. Okay. This next one here, I'll be pretty brief with, this is the sleep, uh, curse. And it's directed by Herman Yao, starring Anthony Wong. And, uh, you know, this is Anthony Wong and Herman Yao go together very well for me. Untold Story of Bullet Syndrome, Taxi Hunter. So here we go, The Sleep Curse. Um, this one opens up with kind of like a little bit of home video deal where we have this guy kind of freaking out. Um, he can't sleep. And at first it seems not like a big deal, but he starts to lose his, you know, mental uh, capabilities. And eventually he lashes out in violence. And then we kind of go to Anthony Wong, who is this um, uh, science teacher talking about, you know, sleep sleep and somehow trying to cure the need for sleep and do all these things. His funding is cut and he's kind of wandering off when somebody from his past life confronts him and talks to him. They had some sort of, you know, a romance, romance a little bit. And he, t she basically tells <coughs> him that I come from this long lineage of families where none of us eventually at a certain age, we can't sleep. We go crazy and we die. Um, so after he tells him that, she starts to fund him to try to fix everything, and he starts to set up, you know, his own private research. Um, then we kind of jump back completely to a different time, and you're like, well, what's this have to do with anything? We know it's Anthony Wong's ancestor, and we know it's um, Japan kind of being brutal to the Chinese in this time during World War II, and then uh, all these kind of awful things about forced prostitution for young Chinese girls and things, and, and then eventually we find out how these two storylines tie together, how, these cur how this curse ties into it, and I don't want to reveal very much, but Wong is great in dual roles, as he always is, um, and the movie features feels more like uh you know science kind of drama but you know it's coming you know the nastiness is coming and it does come and it hits pretty hard we have a brutal brutal stuff at the very end and i love how it ties together how seemingly these characters don't have any correlation but they really do 
and the curse ties in together. Really good movie. Really, really kind of a, a nice difference from something like Untold Story or Ebola Syndrome or Taxi Hunter. Just um, well written, nice, nice uh, done script. Good stuff. So um, the sleeping curse or sleep curse, the sleep curse. Yeah, good. check it out. Okay, the next one up is um, The Haunted Palace by Roger Corman, starring Vincent Price and Long Chaney Jr. I, I didn't know. I did I forgot he was in this. So seeing Vincent Price and Long Chaney Jr. together just was kind of like a thing where I was like, oh, that, that warms my heart, knowing that Long Chaney got to work with Vincent Price and Vincent Price got to work with Long Chaney. I knew I had worked with Boris Karloff a couple times. Um, but yeah, it was so cool seeing this. And this is supposedly the Dunwich Whore, which this really isn't the Dunwich Whore. The only connection is that there's a creature kind of locked away and being fed and 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 the isolated town with you know the possible weird kind of thing going on about it but um when you think of lovecraft in film you definitely think of this especially when fulci would do it in city of the living dead and i feel like city of the living dead is basically a remake of this in a lot of ways it's a little different of course from some plot points but vincent price um plays dual roles and this is also the story they also take the case of dexter ward charles dexter ward and mix it with the dunwich horse so it's two stories in one and at the very end they try to make it tied into Poe and you're just like oh what this isn't a Poe movie but it's okay whatever it's whatever um Vincent Price is great in it he plays like I said dual roles Jack Kerwin and uh Charles Dexter Ward he ends up showing up to um this old town in the beginning, we have like this this uh, group of guys burn um, Vincent Price alive, and he puts a curse on them, similar to Vampire Curse, a Vampire Circus, or Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, um, I will curse you. You know, I'll come back and kill your children's children, that kind of thing. So basically, Vampire Circus or Nightmare on Elm Street. A anyways, uh, he's burned alive, and these townsfolk, the ancestors, still live in there. Um, uh, and you'll recognize some of the townsfolk. Of course, we have Elijah Cook Jr. Or is it Elijah? Yeah, Elijah Cook Jr., who's in Messiah of Evil and film noir stuff and uh the big guy uh leo gordon from intruder the another corman movie which is really good there's a couple corman a uh, couple intruder guys in here the guy who loses his um uh, the um i don't want to spoil too much but the in, the journalist from intruder um who's trying to help out the black family is also in here um with leo gordon as one of the ancestral guys but uh of course they still live here same actors um anyways uh vincent price comes back i guess he's inherited this castle him and his his wife and uh they recognize him from you know the lore the painting in the Kerwin castle and they they want him gone they say I, you should get the hell out of here man we don't want you here it's not a good idea to go to the Kerwin castle it's a dump it's dangerous but they're scared about the old curse that Kerwin put on them but Charles Dexter Ward drove far he seems to be a sophisticated rich man and he says you know I drove all the way out here I'm gonna look at the freaking castle and at least to sell it so they go there and right away he sees a painting of himself basically on the wall and right then that point afterwards he is almost possessed by Jack uh, by uh, by Kerwin so um, it becomes that Charles Dexter's war story which was later done in the resurrected by Dan O'Bannon so uh, yeah <laughs> that's pretty much what happens here he starts to kind of morph and uh, the old legend says he needs three sorcerers one of which is Lon Chaney Jr., who's acting as a butler, and the other the other guy I'm not familiar with, but they end up uh, kind of helping him along the way to create chaos. But Jack Kerwin needs revenge on the people that um, uh, did him wrong, so he starts to focus on you know the people of Dunwich. Um, the atmosphere in this movie is great. the The fog is amazing. the The taverns are great. Um, reminds me of obviously Hammer stuff and later uh, Fulci stuff. Love that superstition. It's my favorite thing. Townsfolk superstition. I love it in horror films. It's one of my favorite things. Like the witches. I, I don't know. Fulci does that really good, and apparently Corman does it really well as 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 well. So I, I love that stuff. I, I love the creature. There's that one amazing shot where um leo gordon's going home and we're outside the window we see him pass by and then we like see the door unlocked or something in the basement we see it's all done in one shot through the the window is really effective the ending is a little lackluster that's the only hit on it it seems like they ran out of money and just tied it up um but anyways i would really recommend checking this one out it's really cool um price is fantastic uh lon cheney jr is really good too he's not as um um haggard as he would become in like the al adamson movies that i've seen him in 
but um, he's not, you know, the charming uh, Lawrence Talbot we all love, but he, he's just got a great screen presence, and um, he just seems like a genuinely sweet person every time he's on screen, so I just like watching him. Um, he captivates me. Great guy, I think. I, I, I get that impersonation that he's a great guy, but he's a great actor and a great legend, as is Vincent Price, but um, the acting's really great, too, and I like the guy who played the lawyer in Intruder. I can't think of his name. He's really kind of a good character, and he, he, he explains the whole story and everything and gets in the detail. He, he mentions Yogg Soghoff um, Yaga uh, Sokhafet, is it Sog Yafat, or oh, whatever the fuck that thing's name is, who is in the mention of the Dunwich Whore, he's the gatekeeper, he pops up and uh, casts a deadly spell, so uh, yeah, anyways, not very much like the story of the Dunwich Whore, but some similarities do apply, um, yeah, anyways, check out Haunted Palace, really dug it, um, don't care for the title in the, in the terms of a Corman movie, but it, I mean, not as Corman as a Lovecraft story, but it definitely fits with a Corman brand so anyways check it out good stuff okay i try to be brief with this one too but this is the only ricky bates jr movie i hadn't seen and this is trash fire um ricky bates jr has a unique voice um he did tone deaf of course from last year i think it was or the year before um excision which is fantastic and suburban gothic he has this dark sense of humor that just is a direct um it has a direct tie to my funny bone he just makes me laugh um he always cast matthew gray gruber in his movies and he's in this one as well but basically this follows kind of a miserable unlikable guy i think it's adrian something isn't it it's the guy from um what was that show entourage i believe it is um he or sure seems like the guy i'm not 100 let me double check it is it is him i had to check um so basically he's a miserable kind of an asshole and the opening <laughs> opens up great he's he's in some sort of um He's getting psych, um, psychiatric help, and um, he's, he's pouring his heart and soul out. It seems like he doesn't open up very much, and he's just like talking about his parents and his past, and, and the psychiatrist falls asleep. It's in the trailer, so it's not too big of a spoiler. And um, he's like, you fell asleep? And he starts freaking out on her. She's like, yes, how do you feel about that? It's just like, it just cracked me up. But anyways, he's having a lot of problems with his girlfriend, and um, he's just a miserable guy. Like some of the things he says i was like oh my god that's it that's it's over this relationship is over um so he has a bad family history he's kind of written off his family his parents are dead he has a grandmother and a sister who burned up in a fire that his parents died in his girlfriend uh basically stays with him on one condition um you go kind of you know try to patch things up with your family and she goes with him and realizes it was a huge mistake because the sister is burnt and and keeps to herself but on top of that she is kind of like this um voyeur lesbian uh and becomes kind of a little bit infatuated or obsessed with um the the, the girlfriend of course and the mother is just an awful religious nut um and it just does not <laughs> end very well i don't want to spoil too much it, it, it's one of his darker movies it ends pretty dark up there with excision and the comedy's pretty well done but there's also some really creepy kind of um you know backwoods texas chitzel massacre beats that i really dug anyways recommend checking this one out it is good stuff um uh trash fire and it's a nice title for the movie very good she's a bad girl she's a very bad girl I know what you're going to be thinking, Dave. What are you doing reviewing this or talking about this? And it's been a long, long time. I'm going to be brief with it, but this is William Friedkin's The Exorcist. And I'm just going to talk briefly about it. It's not going to be an elaborate thing because um, there's so many people out there that have so much a deeper love for this movie and understanding of it as well. But um, William Friedkin is a very interesting director for me. I, I love Cruising, Rampage, super interesting. The Guardian, good stuff. The Bug, good stuff. And then his non-horror stuff or non-horror adjacent stuff is also good too. The, I like the Brinks job, man. So um, The Exorcist, you know, a huge trendsetter for sure. Um, basically made a whole generation twice as religious. As they, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, literally, after this movie came out, people were like, I'm possessed! I'm possessed! Oh, you're crazy. Um, sorry. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? A lot of more people thought they were being possessed after this movie came out. But, uh, yeah, what can I say about it? Um, I've never been a huge fan of the demonic possession genre, but I understand wholeheartedly that this is one of the definitive um, best horror films ever made. Um and the acting's tremendous. Um, Jason Miller's really good in this. I love Jason Miller. Max Van Sydow. Max Van Sydow is great. Um, Linda Blair, of course. Um, and Alan Burson is freaking fantastic, too. So, anyways, what we have here is this uh, actress in Alan Burson. 
and she's going to set every day. And then one day her daughter starts to feel mildly ill, takes her, starts to say weird things like the bed shaking and all that kind of thing, takes her to the doctor and they can't find out what's wrong with her. She starts to kind of slip, become aggressive, curse, all that kind of thing. And before long, she's starting to have some serious um, issues, some of which seem to be demonic so she looks into getting help by all the psychiatrists. No one can help her. They suggest an exorcism. And that's when Jason Miller comes in, a, a, a kind of a, a church psychiatrist who is having a battle with his fate after he lost his mother. Um, he's just, a, he's great in it. Um, very interesting character actor. I, I guess you'd call him a character actor. Would pop up in the fifth of the ninth configuration by Blatty. Um, just just a really endearing character. So Anyways, what happens is he starts to get involved and um, there's some crazy things that happen like the spider walk and some, some green puke and obviously that there's definitely something going on with Reagan. The room is always freezing cold, so it leads up to this exorcism. Um, what I really like about this movie is the humanity between characters. Um, there's a couple characters in here. One of the... Um, Jason Miller's friend. He's a, he's a priest in here, one of his good friends. Um... I, I'm going to spoil this a bit, but the end of that movie, what happens to Miller and how he's laying on those steps and he, he, he runs up to him and he gives him his um, last confession or he gives him his last rites or whatever, um, anything he wants to absolve him of his sins before he... It's just like, wow, oh, that's really good stuff, man. That's really good character moments there. And of course, it ties directly in when he meets the cop and it leads right into Exorcist 3, which is a really cool movie. But I, I just like those little beats like that, you know? Like, that's the stuff that makes the movie for me, really. Like, any movie, especially a... I know it's not. I'm willing for you to get us a horror movie. But any horror movie that can cause you to feel that way. You know what I mean? Because that's really the power in there, right? It's it's the character stuff. Like, you, there's lots of great horror movies. Like, you'll just watch all day super fun stuff. Like, oh, I love watching the Friday 13th movies. But never once are you, like, directly tied in with a character to the point where you really, really, really care about their fate and their well-being and their soul. Their soul, you know? So that that's a really great scene, and I can't say enough about that. Um, and there's some really funny, quirky characters in here that you really kind of forget are in here. I completely forgot they were in here. Like um, Burt Dennings, who, um, which is funny. I just watched this movie, and then I heard Dave Z mention on the podcast about him bringing it up. He's like, you Nazi bastard. And that's another part. I was like, I don't remember this at all, but this is really kind of a crazy, offbeat character in this kind of thing. There's just lots of strange characters, like Burt Dennings when he starts to make fun of the butler, even though he's Austrian, calling him a Nazi and all that kind of stuff. But there's lots of good characters. Alan Burstyn is fantastic and come on tubular bells just this movie i feel i know i'm going to take some backlash for it but it feels more halloween i know it doesn't place place necessarily during halloween but more like a halloween moment when the leaves are blowing on the street and it's following her walk down the street and you hear tubular bells to me that's like oh, that feels very much like a, a nostalgic halloween feeling anyways i don't have that much to say about the movie to be honest like you guys heard what i mentioned um the opening's also really kind of crazy and, and pretty cool too and sets up max really well well but um great film um not a personal favorite but an undeniable classic that is just fantastic and it's probably because the ripoffs of it um, are just a lot of them don't do much for me now i love stuff like demons of course it's one of my all-time favorites or evil speak I like when they get wonky and crazy with it but i've never ever seen the point to make a movie of another person tied into bed screaming unless it's The Exorcist, because it does it so well here. Exorcism of Emily Rose has an interesting take on the subject, because it has the courtroom drama, and it, it kind of semi-based on a real story, as this one is too. But um, the lines in here too, very, very memorable lines, great day for an exorcism, kind of shit like that. And it goes places that you would never think they would go, with the cross, the crucifix. I'm just like, whoa, whoa, man, come on. Like, you're surprised it goes there. Even today, I think... In a mainstream, well-made movie, that would that would make some jaws drop. So anyways, Exorcist, um, classic, right? Uh, what can I say? And now here we go for the Survive 05. And we have uh, also the Patreon pick by Jonathan Wilhelm. And this is Venom. This is a 2005 slasher movie. It's very 2005, if you know what I mean. I've covered a couple of the slashers from this year in 2001. Or 2000 Maniacs. It's a 2001 Maniacs. And, of course, um, House of Wax. Both of which are enjoyable, and Venom is no different. This is a rewatch for me. I've not seen it in a very long time. And immediately I would think that 2005 would have a lot of crummy slashers, and I'm sure it does, but I've not seen any of the crummy slashers just yet. So Venom, uh, this one opens up pretty cool. We have this uh, 
this it has some more character development on some of the kids but the, the real cool moment is we have this uh, guy named ray who's a wrecker and uh he's driving he's got a scar he ends up stopping on the side of the road to um see if uh, a, a woman that works at the local restaurant is okay um a young girl one of the main characters in the movie and they're talking um she's talking with her boyfriend and um they're kind of blocking the bridge this is they're on the bridge and this other woman's driving through in the back seat she has a suitcase with something strange in it she crashes doing all the commotion ahead and she's hanging on side of the, the over the bridge and uh ray goes to save her they pull her out but he goes back for the suitcase because she mentions it turns out what's in that suitcase is a bunch of snakes that were used in ceremonies to drain evil out of people in a voodoo ceremony these snakes bite ray ray and the snakes go overboard they drown um ray ends up getting sent to the morgue on a slab but ray don't stay on that slab ray comes back as this 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 crazy kind of slasher killer um he's kind of like a big kind of muscular guy and he's got um he's he's just a, kind of a cool scary slasher and of course he starts to pick off anybody that's around because he's evil and he has all these evil souls within him really good um set up really good uh for a, for a slasher to be honest and i like that it takes place in the swamp areas you don't see many swamp based horror movies anymore so yeah it turns into a slasher movie starts to pick off the kids bichu phillips is in here and a couple other familiar faces uh the deaths are fairly solid some of them are pretty gory um this one's a very enjoyable slasher with a good setting and a good bad guy could have used a sequel to be honest there is some cgi with the snakes it doesn't look great but you can forgive it it's 2005 and it doesn't look that bad either so yeah venom check it out i really enjoyed this one i think it's pretty cool very easy watch um very enjoyable 2005 movie Okay, we're going to cover Rear Window, and there's nothing we're going to say about Rear Window that probably hasn't already been said by 99% people, you know what I mean, in the world. So yeah. everybody's seen it. I had not seen it, which is crazy because I've seen 4,000 movies that ripped it off. And I knew the plot to Rear Window a million freaking times. But yeah, this is uh, one of the most classic films ever made. Stars Jimmy Stewart, Grace Kelly, um, Raymond fucking Burr. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, this movie's great. This is such a good movie. Such It's so well acted. I like Jimmy Stewart. He's mm -hmm. just a star. Like I said, I don't, it's so weird back at the old movie stars like John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart. Like you can just see why people became obsessed with old Hollywood and all the old stars, even before that, because they had their screen present is like his presence is unmatched. Like there's nobody like this guy and yeah, it's just Jimmy Stewart, but he's so good. Like they actually like cultivated their, like how they were seen to the public. It, it was just such a more complicated thing. Um, anyways, uh, Jimmy Stewart's character is, um, what is his name? Something Jeffries. He basically is a journalist, photographer, um, and he gets a broken leg. He's sitting in the apartment, which is probably, it has to be like a set, the way it's built and everything. Yeah, or at least I built for the movie. Say. It's super elaborate, super excellent. The backdrops are gorgeous, this movie. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that I, I was just complaining about something like, um, Invisible Man's color palette being so goddamn dull and boring and just ugly and that's just like, sometimes that works for certain movies but I know that Rear Window doesn't look like real life but it's so beautiful and I'm here to um, see something beautiful in a movie it, whether it's intelligence wise or visually or whatever and that's what this is this is one of the most this is probably one of the best looking movies I've ever seen yeah. um, the backgrounds are fantastic it's detailed anyways he's in this apartment he's injured so he starts to look out his window and he starts to notice all his neighbors at a distance and they're always in the background and they have their own characters we have the lo Miss Lonely we have the, the salesman and we have a slew of other people the, the musical guy so he becomes Music obsessed guy. with them and then one day um, he's also going through some relationship problems with uh grace kelly who's half his fucking age and gorgeous <laughs> and amazing and perfect and he's actually kind of upset that she's too perfect for him right um and he also has this uh nurse this live-in nurse that's come and helps him everything she's also great and um he also has an old private eye friend he gets involved so those are kind of the big key players so he witnesses something that makes him think that one of the neighbors has committed murder against his ill wife who seemed kind of miserable but she had reasons to be so he starts to dig into it he gets some other people involved and at first 
mo nobody believes him, but they start to come around. And the person he suspects of doing the murder is no other than big ass scary Raymond Burr across the way. Um, right. He I, needs a double door entry <laughs> in and out of his apartment. He's so he's so large. Like he's yeah. just like. I know, he's really good too, <laughs> and I like when they. Um, there's gonna be spoilers here, and I like when they actually confront each other. On point, he's like, "What do you want? I don't yeah. have any money." Like you, in such a typical movie, he'd be like, "Ah, just like go at him like uh, Frankenstein or something." But at mm -hmm. first, he literally, it's so personal, like and realistic in that sense. I'm just saying, like how he comes in, and he's like, "I don't." He's like, I don't have any money or anything like that. Like, he's not this evil person. He's somebody that got caught in the madness and had to cover it up and done on, he will do unspeakable things to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a great movie. Like, I, I don't even know what else to say about it. Um, Well, it, it's fantastic for one. Um, the So, really, there are two locations in this movie. There is uh, Jim Stewart's apartment and then the backyard of Jim Stewart's apartment. Um, and, and that set is so elaborate because it's all, it's almost like a dollhouse. Um, you exactly. have like four or five, panorama. Yeah. You have like four or five different like apartment rooms that he can see. Um, and, and whenever the camera pans over them, there's always something going on in one of the apartments. Um, you'll see, is it, it's Raymond Burr? Yeah. Um, you'll see him like sitting on the couch, smoking a cigarette, all disheveled. And then in the bottom corner, you don't see him. It's just dark. You just well, see the cigarette. Well, you know, you see him on the phone or, or whatever. You'll see yeah. him doing something. But in the bottom corner, you'll see like the bar downstairs, and you'll see all the people yeah. going in and out of the bar. And detail um, too. People shopping. Right. Like, people it's just shopping. So detailed. Um, you'll see. You know, there's like uh, the the ballerina and the guys. You know, all oh, dancing. I love with that. Her. I love that he's, he's Miss, watching her at first. Yeah, like, then you have Miss Lonely downstairs, who's like, you know, who just... who wouldn't watch? I know it sounds terrible right, and perverse, right. but like all these people. But then you see somebody basically like in their underwear dancing. It's like, um, anybody's gonna watch that. Right. I'm sorry. I know it sounds awful, but but you know, it, it it's just like just when, whenever they pan to the backyard and you see everything um you know but the, the basket with the dog the people shopping you know the music players i um, mean it's just so cool and it, like it like it looks really nice um it reminds me of um you know who it reminds me of in dick tracy i think oh, whenever I they love show dick tracy. the city at large yeah. um it just has this really nice like meaty thing to it I, I can't even really put into words I, it just makes you know me very nostalgic. who i think has this attention to detail in their sets and their uh everything like that who del toro i was gonna say del toro with shape of water i felt like it was there mm -hmm. like i felt like he definitely was kind of doing that and and this one it's not even a period piece it's taking place in the time it is but it doesn't feel it, it i mean it is pretty timeless yeah. um it, it i mean it doesn't feel like um real the real world just because the colors are so vibrant and everything right. but people act um intelligent they they're smart they don't do dumb things to me i mean there's obviously some suspense moments like grace kelly does some shit shit where i'm like oh no what right. do you do she's got guts man like yeah uh the dog is is heartbreaking the dog is heartbreaking um you know when we were uh what was that one we were watching two sisters the tale of two sisters no, or just sisters? Just sisters. See both um, of when we got that one guy and he's like going through the apartment and he's all like, Ugh. Oh, that, that we saw that. <laughs> this happened in a... Yeah, because, you know, Brian De Palma just was like, I'm a, he, I mean, sisters is rear window. Sisters is rear window. Yes. And, and, and also Fright Night is rear window. And also Do You Like Hitchcock is rear window. And mm -hmm. um, the Tales in the Crypt episode is rear window where, yeah where she loses their voice after she witnesses the murder and right. it turns out she goes to the doctors and the doctor is the fucking murderer. It's just like, dude, <coughs> I don't know. This movie is like, this is uh, the movie that I have never seen, but I've seen it a hundred times. hundred times. It's Simpsons Muppet Babies. Simpsons did it. I mean, it's, it's like, this is like, <laughs> no, but that part and the sisters, I thought was so funny. Right. Charles Durian keeps coming to the window and he's like, I, I, and he doesn't, he comes back again. He's like, and that happens here. Grace Kelly's like, right? She's like, look, at, it's verbatim. It it is. Um, the 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 nurse. I think she's fantastic. She's great. Too. She's very funny. I think does she kind of agree with Jimmy Stewart before? Yeah, she comes around before. Yeah. Um. Well, also, life is kind of um boring sometimes. Yeah. So this kind of crazy stuff that happens, like sometimes, especially Stewart, he 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 needs that excitement because he was a journalist and all that. So he gets he gets hyped into it. He gets sucked into it. Well, you know, his whole thing is like, you know, he goes abroad and like for, like photographs in like Morocco and like in the desert, yeah. and 
he has this girlfriend who's like like the high society of whatever town there. He in. doesn't think she can rough it for a living, right? Um, and then or he doesn't want her to. He doesn't. He want doesn't to put want her. her, to her to. She thinks she deserves better. You know, and so it's like, and she's like, I can give you every opportunity here. You know, fashion photography, this and that, and this and that. And he's like, well, I want to go out to Morocco. And, oh, you know, I just want to run around and do crazy things. Right. You know, you can't wear those kind of boots out in the jungle. Yeah, crazy broad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say and that. And then, uh, sure enough, you know, the, the pages are flipped. You know, he has to stay inside, and she's the one going out, breaking into apartments, digging up dead bodies in the flower bed. <laughs> um, um, I doubt he wants nurse. that much adventure after this movie, to be Right, honest. and then... Um, you know, it ends the way it ends, but... I think you should check out some other Jimmy Stewart stuff. You know, I'm not an expert or anything. I've seen, like, Miracle on 34th. I think everybody's seen that movie, right, on television? Is that the Santa Claus one? It's not a Santa, but, you know, it's a Christmas movie. I saw the Santa Claus one with, I think, Richard Attenborough. I think that is... Um... No, I sorry, that is Miracle on 34th Street. I'm thinking It's a Wonderful Life. My, oh, I've never my, seen my It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, um, but the one that's really is something is the man who shot liberty valance and like i think that you knowing john wayne and jimmy stewart to watch that movie i think would be really um great for you i mean it's so cool and it just like it plays on their character types really well but also is completely i I mean it's like objectively possibly the best western i've ever seen is that the one i think i did it's it's black and white that one it it starts off with the funeral right yeah yeah, the one yeah, yeah And then, you know, they go back and they tell the story and then they forward back to the present yep, yep, day and they're like, oh, we got cars now. or You know what it means. Yeah. He's like famous and he's got to go back. But no, I just like, he's just, inter- he's, he's, he's likable, man. He's yeah. likable. Even in the stuff like the far country that I saw where he's an asshole, like you like watching him. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's a great movie. I, I can't really say any negativity about it. Like, there's the acting's great, the set is great, the camera work, everything's great. The way the story unfolds, it's the it's like the best of obviously the trendsetter, man. I would say, um, and a lot of times when you go back and watch the trendsetter, they're not as good as because you've seen shit right. rip it off, and a lot of times that will ruin a movie. Does mm-hmm. not do anything to this. Does not hurt this at all. I I know I wasn't here for your um Invisible Man movie review. Okay. Um, you know I wasn't a big fan, and it, it's because. It was just like a hour and a half of gaslighting, and you, as the audience, you know, it's like, well, if he's invisible, it's called the Invisible Man. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think my big complaint with that movie was like they really needed a character to believe the wife, to believe that, or somebody, to, to side or to, with just her. to look into it for a second. Um, and so when you're watching this movie, they do eventually, they do because he provides enough evidence. Like she was, well, I think it, so. It, it, the evidence is shaky. He's like. Like, well, she was sick. Where is she now? You know, like, the, her purse is there. You, you know, like, but, like, the, you know. What the, kind the, of woman lays your wedding ring by? Right, but those characters, I mean, you know, they, they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. And and I think it adds, because as the audience, you don't know what happened. No. Um, you know, we don't know that the man's invisible. I know he's bad. You know why? Because it's Raymond Burr. Right. And you know what? I, I don't think that, I think that he didn't bury her body around the city. I think he just ate her. No, in the ending, they say that he... Um, he oh, you're her. making a joke. Okay. <laughs> like, like, he to... like, I don't know. <laughs> um, oh, that's a shout-out to Derek. We always talk about Raymond Burr eating people and Russell Crowe also eating people. I don't know who Derek is or Russell Crowe, for that matter. You know who Russell Crowe is. Um, <laughs> he's a snake, right? What are you talking about? That's Kurt Russell. we got to end this before you embarrass yourself further. Oh. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know Kurt Russell or Russell Crowe. I confuse him. Like uh, stop it! No, it's true. I don't know. Russell Crowe is Gladiator and Javert. I've never Kurt seen Kurt Russell as Snake and in the and in the uh, and Tombstone. Oh, and he's in a uh, Guardians of the Galactica. Gar- Guardians of the yeah. Galaxy Two. Okay, Ergo, okay. Planet. This has nothing to do with it. Okay, yeah. Um. Well, now I got distracted. I forgot. Oh yeah. About... So so yeah. I think it really helps when when a character sides with the main yeah. character and when they're trying to unravel a mystery, just because it's like. We know, we know. Even as the artist, we don't know that he killed her. But, um, you know, I think it just... There's just better interaction between char- characters than just like, oh, you're crazy, we're going to put you in an asylum, asylum again. It's like, I don't want to watch that. But, anyways, um, Rear Window. Uh, again, maybe a 5 out of 5. 5 out of 5. I can't. Yeah, why not? You can't do that, yeah. so... Yeah. The um, end? Yep, I'm done. Is there any other movies we're reviewing? No, I don't think so. Oh, thank God. All right, that's enough for me. I'll we're see you done. next week. This is the scene of the crime. 
a crime of passion filmed in a way you have never seen before and as no one else would dare attempt but the screen's master of suspense the producer director who shocked the world with psycho This is the apartment of a man named Jeffries, a news photographer whose beat used to be the world. Right now, his world has shrunk down to the size of this window. He's been watching the people across the way. Nobody seems to pull their blinds during a hot spell like this. He knows a lot about them by now. Too much, perhaps. For instance, down there on the second floor, the woman pacing about. He calls her Miss Lonely Hearts so lonely that even death seems like a friend. These are the newlyweds on a honeymoon no one will ever forget. He calls her Miss Hearing Aid, an artist of a very odd and strange art. The songwriter who plays the same melody over and over again. A genius or insane? This is the traveling salesman and his invalid wife. Out of their arguments and nagging comes a weird kind of love. Miss Torso, the body beautiful, that is, viewed from a safe distance. Those are just a few of my neighbors. First I watched them just to kill time, but then I couldn't take my eyes off them, just as you won't be able to. And you won't be able to take your eyes off the glowing beauty of Grace Kelly, who shares the heart and curiosity of James Stewart in this story of a romance shadowed by the terror of a horrifying secret. this show today because i got more to say hey guys welcome to blind okay. side here we're going to discuss um peter <laughs> fritz lang <laughs> <laughs> thanks Steve, you, you threw me off um fritz lang's m from 1930 1931 starring peter laurie of course <clears throat> and Yesterday, was it last week where you were like, M's a silent movie, I don't want it. It's not silent. <laughs> I, I thought and then for some silent. reason I just rolled with it because I was like, oh, is it silent? I think it is silent. Everybody's making fun of us. Like, it's not silent. Everybody's outraged. Yeah. That's why it's blind spot because these are first time watches and I don't know why we thought it was silent. I don't know why. Because oh, well, Metropolis is. I right, think that's this is probably... the third Fritz Lang movie I've seen, two of which have been silent. So I so just there assumed okay. that um, it was before well, I sound mean, was invented. What we come up with at Fritz Lang, usually you said wants to have two sides come together for one final act kind of deal. Yeah, a lot of his movies are two sides kind of reaching a conclusion or, or, or a compromise, I guess I should say. Yeah. Um, again, I've only seen two. I've seen Metropolis, which is like the... And the Nibelungen. And, and Nibelungen. Um, in, the, in Metropolis, it's like the workers versus like the rich people. Something like High that. Society. The, the forming of the union, right? Yeah, the Nibelungen. It's like, um, it's like the trolls and the gods and uh, you know the humans in the middle, the right? Humans. So okay, M basically follows the story of uh, there's a child murderer going around, uh, and they mention I think they actually mention Fritz Harman in the story, which. So, because I thought this was based kind of around Fritz Harman, but definitely kind of inspired by him. I think they do yeah. mention Fritz Harman, who is a very infamous German, I believe, serial killer that kind of survived by going through the depression and everything and would, you know, kind of identify as, a, act like he was a cop or worked with the cops too. So he could kind of lure children in and then rape them and, I think, eat them and sell them and give them eat away his <laughs> gifts and stuff for favors. But this one follows a character who's very much like that. He's a child murderer and obviously sexually um, deviant sexual problems um they don't necessarily show it but at points the police officers do 
do mention it without saying it. They say, well, you know what happened to the bodies, and they don't want right. to talk about it. So um, right away in the beginning, it's kind of like these little kids are singing this uh, nursery rhyme, fairy tale, mm. like kind of like London Bridge, but it involves the killer. And this one woman gets very upset with them, and she's like, stop it, you know, because it's obviously nerve-wracking destroying this whole city in a similar way that Jack the Ripper did um, to uh, in Whitechapel. So they're kind of going nuts. Um and the, the mother goes inside, and one of the other mothers says, just let him do it. And then all the kids come home from school. Everybody's going home, and the mother who was defending the kids, um, daughter doesn't show up. Right. She's gone. And, and that whole part is terrifying. Mm-hmm. And we, we, see, we do see what happens, though. Um, and I really like how they did it and showed the murder. Like, we see him buy the balloon, and we see him give the little girl the balloon, and then later on she has a ball. And instead of an elaborate murder, we see the ball roll away and the balloon go up to the sky. And you're like, oh, that is also symbolic and great, but it also let me know exactly what happened. So you really don't need the gore or nastiness, and especially in a movie like this. It right. never got away with it anyways. Yeah, I'd say that th- this movie, it really follows more like the police procedural side well, of things. Um follows two, three different sides. It, the- it, yeah. The well, parent, the victims of the parents. The victims, the parents, um, the... The, the police the and the police criminals. and the criminals. Um, you know, the police have no leads, no clues to go off of. There's uh, several scenes of them, like, talking like, the commissioner, talking to the mayor, like, what are you guys doing? It's like, we got nothing. This guy's not leaving any... And- anything behind for us to really follow and they're cut back and forth together to the table kind of almost and, and, and seamlessly but you're kind of like what wait what are they back so they're kind of saying that they're almost the same and then the same kind of uh predicament you know well what ends up happening is the the police's answer at first is just well let's just go to the cd underbelly arrest everyone there and see what happens and so that and that is what leads to the criminals like like, these police are upping their game. We gotta find this guy and stop him. What he's doing is heinous. Um, the police are interfering in our in- source yep. of income. And that's when we get the scene of, like, the the two sides. Uh, the the police are like, this is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna fix it. And then it'll, like, immediately cut, like, mid-conversation to the criminals. And they're doing the exact same thing. Like, like this is our plan. Yep. This is, you know, this is what we know so far. And, you know, we're going to set up this elaborate system. And the movie kind of follows for about 30 minutes after this scene of just, you don't, it, it just kind of like just shows people going through motions. Um, uh, I do like um, the portrayal of Peter Lorre. And I, it is a police right. procedural and it's way ahead of its time. And I love that. Um, Peter Lorre is fantastic in it. And yes. the end comes to a giant kind of, um, oh, the, the criminals in this movie are straight out of a Victor Hugo novel. Like, oh, the yeah. Hunchback, and it spends a lot of time on them. They all have elaborate characters. There's this really big kind of, I don't want to say set piece, but scene where they're in this uh, kind of abandoned, oh, not abandoned, but closed down building after dark, a bank, and mm-hmm. all the criminals are trying to find Peter Lorre. That's a really well done scene. Um, and this one's not super long, like you would think, with the uh, Fritz Lang movie. You're not going to sit there for three and a half hours. It's it's under two, which right. is kind of cool. Um the city looks great, too. Black and white, all that stuff. Oh, um, it looks fantastic. And the ending is kind of what I want to talk about. It's so funny that this movie came way before Nazi Germany. Not way before. It actually kind of was probably starting to rise. When was the first rise of Hitler that was shot down? Probably in the 30s, right? Hitler did come to power, was. and then he was arrested, and then he wrote Mein Kampf, right? Mein Kampf? I believe so. And then he got out, and that's when he kind of... Then in the 30s. I think it's like, like right after World War II, then he's in jail in the 20s. Um, and then in the thirties is when he starts really. Okay. Yeah. But he had a first rise and then, um, so kind of, it's it's strange to me that they have at the end, almost there's an argument to spare the killer. Right. And it's weird to me that, um, Nazi Germany didn't spare many people afterwards. It's strange how they seem to have almost a moral compass here in, which is more than most people would have for a child murderer, myself Mm -hmm. included (laughs) at that point. Um, I probably would have been one of the ones beating him to a bloody pulp there. I, and I know that's completely wrong. It's just, he's a child killer. Well, we don't know that he's a child killer. Yes, we do. No, we don't. Who, what What evidence do they have against him? The confession of a blind man. A blind man singles him out. That's says, all it took in Frankenstein. That's all it took. <laughs> it was, was the confession of a blind man. And, you but know, as the audience, taken, we do know. As the audience, we, we it, infer. It, we it's, never it's, see. It's kind of like never see. we've seen the balloon float away. We saw, we, but we never see <laughs> Peter Lorre actually commit but, a crime. 
well, messing with kids is really weird in a way. But it, it's like 10 to midnight. Right. See, we're on <laughs> the side of Bronson only because we know that the guy that he thinks is the killer is the killer. Otherwise, Bronson is a crooked cop. He's doing all these fucked oh, up right. things. I know he's guilty. Why? He was masturbating. But <laughs> in 10 to Midnight, we see the killer commit a crime. In this movie, you do not see Peter Lord commit a crime. We do, basically. No. Like I you said, s- you see if, if do you think... Hold on. Well, let me finish. Do you think if this movie wasn't made in the 30s, they would have showed him commit the crime? Or do you think that's a big point at the end of the movie? I think that's a big point at the okay. end of the movie. Okay. Because there is a second character who, um, there, there's a child, he asks the, the man what time it is. Yeah, that old man is not the killer. But hold on, though. But so Mob mentality. The I'm... mob mentality. They rush this man based off no evidence. It's just a man talking to a child on the street and saying, hey, you should get home. Where do you live? I'll walk you home. And the mob swarms him. Now we have Peter Lorre, who does confess in the kangaroo court that he, you know, has a sickness. Sure, but what led up to that kangaroo court occurring in the first place was a blind man saying, "This man whistled a song. He's the murderer." He is we, the murderer. We never actually see the stop murderer. It, stop I'm, it. I'm just saying. I'm just hey, saying. It was good enough for the Cenobites and Hellraiser. <laughs> we heard it from your own lips, Frank. That was enough. We but, had to hear you confess. He confessed. I know, I know. They coursed a confession out of him. Right. But it's a very interesting ending because Laurie gives this giant spiel where he's oh, just like fantastic. screaming. And it's not like the other Peter Laurie stuff where I saw where he's like in the film noir as kind of like the heavy, which is really like sinister and cool. Mm-hmm. Or like where he's in the Corman stuff where he's like, I'm drunk and hilarious and, and somewhat like charming. This one, he is literally like acting his like heart and soul out right. screaming. And it's just like, I believe this guy is a psycho. And has problems. But, like I said, um, <coughs> it's not your fault you're sick, but it's 110% your fault um, that you know you're sick and you're not doing anything about it. And that's that's what Marcus Parks always said in the last podcast on the left, and it was like, it's so true. He mm-hmm. was like, you're, it's not your fault you have the illness, but your illness is your responsibility. And if you know you're sick, then you do not belong in society. And he knew damn well he was sick. And he, he knew he what he was knew doing. He was sick. And he knew what he was doing. He couldn't control it. But yeah, he, he knew what he was doing, though. He pointed at everybody else in that crowd, and he was like, you know, if any of you learned a job, a skill, you know, you wouldn't be cracking safes and, and picking pockets, you know. You know what you are, and yet you continue to do what you are. And the whole reason why they have this court is because the increased police presence... Doesn't is, let them carry out business. Doesn't let them carry out their business. Well, um, I, you know, I, I, and I think that... In the end, that's the point of the movie. Like, like, what is a confession? What, you know, how can you be so certain of a crime? I think there's a reason why it's a blind man that accuses him. Um, and and then you know, it again, it's two sides. It's the police and the criminals coming together to, you know, finish one single goal. You know, who's to say what's right or wrong? You know, it, it is up to interpretation. Um, that makes it much more intelligent movie, right? Oh, it's it's a fantastic movie. I mean, what does even M stand for? Is it murder? It's the is mark. It, is it mark? Is it masterpiece? Is, is it, it madness? The, madness, the thirteenth letter. I mean, what is M? You know, they do mark him with the M, but they mark him with yeah. the M. They mark the murder with the M in Fritz Lang's masterpiece. In in they mark the murder who <laughs> suffers from madness in Fritz Lang's masterpiece M. Of his 13th film. I actually don't know if it's his <laughs> No, 13th it's probably film. not. Um, okay, so I'm going to read from. You read first because you have oh, the yeah. biography. So, my on... list of Peter yeah. Lorre biography. It's not in this book, um, but it does have. This is, I think, our my fourth movie seeing Peter Lorre. He died at 60. Wow. Oh, he died right after those Corman movies, huh? Yeah. 19... Peter Lorre, 1904 to 1964. Um, I adore Peter Lorre, and I, I really do want to see more of him. <clears throat> One of the great movie villains of the 30s and 40s, Lorre, born in Hungary as Laszlo Lohenstein, was a popular stage actor in Berlin when he made his sensational screen debut as a pathetic child murderer in Fritz Lang's M. After working for Alfred Hitchcock in England, Lorre came to the States where he made his Hollywood debut in Mad Love and subsequently became a popular member of the Warner Brothers stock company, Austin team with Sidney Greenstreet in a variety of mysteries and melodramas. In the 60s, a more rotund Peter made a minor comeback in several Roger Corman flicks. Um, I'm going to list his movies. We got M in 1930, 
Mad Love, 35. Stranger on the Third Floor, and 40. You'll Find Out, 40. The Face Behind the Mask, 41. Invisible Asian, 42. The Boogeyman Will Get You, 42. The Beast with Five Fingers, 46. Tales of Terror, 62. The Raven, 63. And The Comedy of Terror, 64. Is that the one with, um... Comedy of Terror. That's Vincent Price, I believe, as well. With uh, the, they do the Black Cat and the cast. No, no. Tales of Terror is the one you're thinking of. Is that with Peter Lorre and Vincent? I think Price? so. Did you mention that one? It Maybe wasn't. It's not I in didn't there. see it in there. That okay. that was. That I think that was really the fun. first Peter Lorre one that I had seen. Yeah, that's the anthology one. So I'm gonna read from John Stanley's Creature Features, and this is M. 1930, four out of five, fascinating portrait of abnormal sexuality. Years ahead of its time in technique and psychological insight, this trend-setting German film was directed by Fritz Lang, who co-wrote the unique crime study with Thea von Harber. Lang employed real Berlin underworld characters in small but pivotal roles. Peter Lorre made his screen debut as a perverted child murderer who wants to stop but can't resist his homicidal impulses. The role made Lorre famous but typecast him for life. Lang was an imaginative filmmaker, a fact reflect in every frame of his innovative work. Ellen Widman, um, Ingrid Lungut, Heater von Walter. There was an American remake in 1951 that was never, that has never appeared on tape. Wow. Weird. I wonder if it's lost. Hmm. 1951. That would be strange. An American remake. Who would, you can't replace him. No. It's kind of weird. Who would you, how would they remade M? I mean, like, I think M had to be the major inspiration for Psycho and all those movies, right? I Maybe, maybe. Diabolique was that was that before Psycho too? Like I, any time with psychological characters and stuff, you know, you kind of it has to be. I feel like Hitchcock, the only person that maybe French movies probably before, but I imagine that Hitchcock probably inspired a bunch of French movies with his movies before. I don't know. I would so. say, you know, I, again, I haven't seen that much of Psycho, but um, I don't know if this one is in the same vein as a psycho. Well, I'm just like, talking about the psychological stuff. Right. Yeah, there's psychological stuff in here, but it it's really at the very, very end, and it's more just Peter Lorre like mm. saying, "Don't do this to me." Well, I like. I think it's super interesting that it definitely reflects the Jack the Ripper case with him writing to the police and stuff. Yeah, and the Jack like, the Ripper. Maybe he wants to be caught because he has some sense of guilt, but also it's an ego trip too. That's just that's a complicated fucking mess with those kind of people, and it's just like they. Always Always try to like <laughs> at the bottom end of the day it's like their brain is damaged like right. it doesn't work the same way as it should so like when you think that doesn't make logical sense no it doesn't like they are not acting logically they have a rhythm and a rhyme to their insanity but it doesn't mean that it doesn't translate into the real world yeah, i feel so. um next week i think is master of the world we'll pick that one back off it, it's your pick vincent price i think charles bronson too so that's is a, he really i think he is in it and that's the oh, second one they were in together after yeah. house of wax from 54 53 um which is a really cool movie so yeah you good yeah, oh we yeah. didn't rate it oh yeah uh, for uh, I mean, historically, it's a five out of five. And I, I'd give it a nine. Let's just go nine out of ten. It's a five out of five. Okay. I mean, I I enjoyed every moment of it. Um, you know, I, I was delighted to see that it wasn't going to be silent because I, as much as I love Nibelungen and um, Metropolis, I, I I was not going to be able to tolerate sitting through a three hour silent. It's film only again. two, <laughs> and silent movies. Are, the only hit on a silent movie is that I have to wait for the dumb um, postcard. And I know people are like, well, that's the... Sun. If they would just do, like, and literally run under subtitles underneath the postcard, I would be so much more I would it. agree. I'm so used to reading subtitles. That's all. 90, I put them on all the time. Every movie I read subtitles anyway. So. Right. And, um, and I, I think I had this issue when we were watching um, Dr. Caligari, is I never know if the subtitle is the dialogue for the scene that just preceded it. Or the scene that's about to occur, and a lot of times I get confused because you know I, I'm not paying attention or whatever. So if they just get rid of the card and just like just put a little subtitle, like like with like like an opera, you know. You, I'm sure you, that they do those. Um, they do um, renew versions of them. Yeah. And do that stuff. So, anyways, uh, I'm good. You? Yeah, I guess. I don't care. Okay, guys, let's get into these questions. Nick Mua. As the season to be jolly is upon us, what's the funniest, most hilarious thing you ever witnessed on or around Xmas? For me, it had to be an animatronic Santa climbing up and down the side of a skyscraper near my place of work years ago who lost his pants. I can hear you think it. Jingle balls. I didn't, but you, you, you thought it for me. Uh, okay. Jeez. Um, 
Funniest thing on around Christmas. Um, oh, one time we used to go to like, you know, family parties and this thing kind of became an inside joke among a couple of my family members. And, uh, we started just roughhousing in somebody's basement. My grandpa, me, my cousin, my uncle Jim, and we're just, maybe my dad, we were just screwing around and just like roughhousing in the basement. And I'm like, eh, 10, 12, you know, then you got my like 40 year old dad, whatever, you know, my like 60 year old grandpa, we're just screwing around. And, uh, a guy about my grandpa's age, whose house it is, he starts yelling at us. Like, and it's just so funny that he left and we just were like, <clears throat> so we made this song about him and I shouldn't sing it, but it involved a have a holly jolly. We changed all the lyrics and I don't want to say it just in case, you know, it would hurt somebody's feelings, but it was very funny to us. And we had this whole song, uh, elaborate. We changed the lyrics and we used to sing it all the time. It was funny. Um, and then we are more of a jolly Santa around Christmas or an absolute Krampus. Also, do your cats like to play with destroy Xmas, uh, decorations? Sometimes they do. Uh, goblin who died actually knocked down the tree before and, uh, he was a great cat. Uh, just an asshole. Loved him for it, but, uh, not too bad. Um, I I'm all right around Christmas. I like to give the kids presents, but I don't see the point in exchanging gift cards with adults, but we do it anyways. Hey, it is what it is. I like seeing my family, you know, I like hanging out, talking, you know that I can talk. What's your favorite Christmas related horror movie? That would have to be Christmas Evil. Love it. Love it. And then we have some answers. Uh, basically, I asked you what was your favorite Christmas oriented present you received or gave? Um, Nick Mua, just sir, if you will, but this for Christmas, I'd be getting the Harry Potter's Wizards collection, a fantastic looking box set with 31 discs chock full of extra goodies and about 11 hours worth of inform informative docs. Ken Coakley, my best Christmas present wasn't movie related christmas 1981 when i was 15 my grandmother knew that i was into music and wanted to get me a few records she got me 20 albums all hard rock slash heavy metal and that batch i got the first iron maiden album as well as their made in japan live uh episode asian as well as judas priest deep purple when i was a kid i loved visual toys because we had no cable or video in those days when i was seven i got to give a shoe by a uh, shoe uh, give a show projector, which was flashlight like device that showed film strips of Scooby Doo Super Friends. When I was 11, I got Star Wars Viewer, which came with cartridge that you would pop in, look in the viewer, and turn the crank and watch five minute version of Star Wars. Oops, I mean Star Wars Episode 4 A New Hope. <laughs> I knew what you meant. The cartridge was compatible with a toy called Snoopy's Drive-In, which is a drive-in screen attached to a base that also had Snoopy in a car watching peanut shorts. I had it since I was eight and popped in the Star Wars cartridge and had Snoopy watching Star Wars. One last toy, my favorite toy as a kid, was the Viewmaster. Vinegar Syndrome just put out the Silent Madness Viewmaster this Black Friday. When I was 10, I got a talking Viewmaster viewer with Batman and G.I. Joe reels. Isimiso, uh, damn son, you really ripped the new one for The Invisible Man. I didn't think it's a bad movie, just don't like it. Um, I love that movie, but I understand your reasoning. The restaurant scene, I do agree, can quickly dispute the fact that she did it because cameras would have picked up the truth. Naked Blood is a great watch. That chick who started frying her finger, body parts, and eating it, yikes. I need to know what the cactus represents and why it's there. It's been driving me crazy for years, and I've seen the movie probably about five times. I hope you enjoy the uh, Guilty of Romance. It's my favorite Sion Sano film. Lots of hot set scenes, haha. -ha. Sano's wife plays a lead role and does a great job portraying a bored housewife that tries to break the monotony of marriage life and gets in, gets in kinds of trouble and gets and kind of gets into trouble by doing so. He casts his wife in a lot of his films and she's absolutely gorgeous. My fave Xmas gift is basically every movie I've ever gotten. I've never been the type that wants jewelry or flowers or clothes or designer handbags. Just give me horror films and I'll be a happy camper. I'm the same boat. Man, his wife is in Coldfish and she's absolutely gorgeous. She's got a great look. She's also a very good actress. Um, I like her a lot. Cody Lee Harden, when I gave your uh, Braxis on DVD trash um jj gordon the entire seinfeld series with all those extras coffee table book etc jordan bibby exorcist vhs nick anderson either my vhs copy of heavy metal or king kong and verse godzilla matt reedy the best movie ever roadhouse okay mike espinizo um ll how can someone buy for you when you own everything on two or three formats <laughs> the most impressive movie related gift for me was when my uncle paid 85 dollars on a king of the uh on a king of the kickboxers vhs tape in 1991 yes you know when new releases were released on vhs they were insanely expensive no doubt it's like like you lost a tape in the video store your parents were like why why'd you lose it why'd you break it it's gonna cost me like a hundred dollars they'd be freaking out peter Engelin watching gremlins with my older sisters in the cinema matthew hudson received back when i was 10 or 11 i got the indiana jones trilogy box set on vhs perhaps it was the age i was or the fact that it was the first box that i had but i love that thing given i don't think i have ever been 
more pleased than when I found a horror DVD I knew you didn't have and gave it to you. That was a risky gambit, and while it wasn't exactly Christmas, it counts, damn it. Comments. 81 Oak Ridge. With The Invisible Man, I have the 4K2, and it's way too dark. I actually liked it, but I didn't like how dark the movie was in general. I agree, man. That 4K. Pitch black. Uh, Floyd75 Dylan. I agree with you on the murder in the restaurant. Not only on the security footage, but CSI and detectives know how murders are committed and would have known instantly how implausible it would have been for that woman to have committed that murder. Uh, Kentuckinator. Uh, finally, someone defends the narrative con- inconsistencies in Ghoulies 3 against the snooty fart uh, fans of the Invisible Man. Like I said, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. Um, Ricky Riley. Yes, you're finally catching Franco fever. And I will tell you, it is syphilis. Uh, yeah um milo 169 i really hope that invisible man would be one of the better movies of the year i liked it but it was kind of disappointing also m is not a silent movie is it no i'm an idiot hey um jason bovey the blind spot segment continues to amaze me given the gargantuan size of your movie collection as well as your cinematic taste the last man on earth wow i would have never guessed you hadn't seen that one until now i know right um but also people i've never heard anyone say it was great i just heard it brought up and then never spoken of jason bovey hey i just finished listening to the greatly entertaining Ruggiero diodato podcast although i'm against animal cruelty regardless of the circumstances i was in disbelief that the other two commentators thought that the butchering of a harmless turtle was less cruel than the killing of a reptilian predator like a crocodile right I did start laughing when one of the guys said the crocodile reminded him of a dog. What? Oh, well, to each their own, I guess. I think his size, how he moves. But still, I understand. I, I don't understand why they picked the crocodile over the, the turtle to me. It's just like, I've seen turtles killed in real life. A uh, snapping turtle, a bit different than the sea turtle. Still very unpleasant. I remember we were doing, me and my brother were doing concrete work. Um, my dad used to run his own business. Um, and uh, my brother was like, turtle's pretty cool, right? Until that guy killed it. And I was like, yeah. Uh, Ken Coakley, John Wayne worked with Bruce Dern in War Wagon as well. This uh, Dern's role in the Cowboys was controversial because the movie was based on a book, and it was publicly known that Bruce Dern was going to kill John Wayne in the movie. One day, Wayne joked with Dern, saying, You know, Dern, you're going to be the most hated man in America. Dern replied, But I'll be a hero in Berkeley. Dern was also in Hang'em High with Clint Eastwood as well as Silent Running, which you reviewed and was the inspiration for Mystery Science Theater 3000. The original MST3K premise was supposed to be inspired by the Omega Man, with Joel running a projector like Charles Neston did when he watched Woodstock in the abandoned theater. Very cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I heard that story about Bruce Dern. Tell it. I love that. That's a, such a great story with John Wayne and Dern. Um, Warren and Tia's box. Mr. Parker, your friend in the midpoint, looks like he lives in the street. And the novelty of his washed hair for the show is just too bewildering, etc. It's like, who, what, why, where? Does his battery get recharged, especially for the show? Do you actually know him? Does he know you, etc., etc.? Okay, let me say this. Jeremy works third shift. I work first. So when we have to find a time to record... One of us is going to be freaking really tired or had just gotten up. So that's kind of what's going on with that. So, you know what I mean? That That's what's going on. Jamie uh, Flyer, I watched Deadly Games uh, last weekend. I thought it was super good, but also really intense. The actor playing the psychic Santa Claus was playing a really great villain. It was great playing the villain. Yes, he was. And sometimes you wonder, they just like go to the insane asylum like, hey, can we let this guy out for the day? I'm um, his uncle. We're just going to take him out and get him some food. And they're like, then they just film with him. Uh, Bobby D 71, the painted bird is fantastic. It's the only movie that comes, uh, came anywhere near parasite for best movie of the year for me. And I think, do we have any more pages? I think that's all we got. So question of the week, what is the best home uh, video release of the year? Is it the Dawn of the Dead Second Sight 4K? Is it the uh, Shinya Tusoka Mato uh, box set? Is it the Forgotten Jolly Volume 2? Is it Beastmaster? Let me know. What is the best release of the year? I know it's only December something, but let me know. Um, And anyways, we're going to hop into this update. Okay, let's hop into this bad boy. First, let's start with the 4Ks. Had to get Total Recall. I mean, this is one of my all-time favorite movies. Arnold Schwarzenegger, amazing. Um, <laughs> Paul Verhoeven, come on. Michael Ironside, Ronnie Cox, get your ass to Mars. Hey, Benny, screw you. What a, I love it, I love it. Um, Air Force One, have not seen in years. Always enjoyed it, man. Harrison Ford, good stuff. Gary Ullman. Uh, look forward to rewatching this one. Remember it being a very solid action movie. And then we have um, the Vinegar Syndrome Beastmaster on 4K. Man, this is crazy. These sets are so insane to me. Like, I don't even know how to open this. Like, they're getting to the point now where they're just more complicated than, like, I would ever expect. Okay, it's it's a freaking book. 
All right, man. Very freaking cool. Uh, there's a book in here. Then we have the disc. Yeah, man. 4K A Beastmaster by Don Coscarelli. It's a movie that I only ever saw on television. And I don't even know if I saw the whole thing. It just was uh, just always on. So, uh, yeah, that, that's crazy, man. Talk about an elaborate, awesome freaking set, right? Cool, cool. Awesome. Then we have, of course, some Blu-rays for Vinegar Syndrome. We got the Forgotten Gialli uh, Volume 2. Um, the funny thing is I, I'm so busy lately that I don't even get to look at these. I just get to put the box in my room, open it, make sure everything's there, and set it down. So we got a girl in Room 2A, My Dear Killer, The French Sex Murders. Um, I've actually seen The French Sex Murders. That's the one with the Humphrey Bogart impersonator. Um, actually, I remember liking it, though. Girl in Room... Uh, 2A was a Mondo Macabro release, and I don't think I ever finished it. And then we have um, the French Sex Murders. Look at look at fake Bogart on there. Yeah, another Mondo release. And then we have My Dear Killer, which was a um, shameless release, but also put out by, I want to say, Shriek Show. So yeah, three upgrades for me uh, all on Blu-ray. And I'm a sucker for any Euro horror that is old on Blu-ray. I will buy it, in case you guys didn't know that. So all those releasing companies, like, yeah, um, anything. I'll even buy P Pumba Man, okay? I'll buy anything when it comes to that stuff. Then we have Silent Madness, 1980s slasher movie. The tear has just begun. Okay, that's a cool shot, man. I don't know if I've ever seen this one. I don't think I have. I think I have a VHS chill in there. But yeah, he's out now. The tear has just begun. Silent Madness in 3D. And that was an 83, wasn't it? Uh, to match the other um, freaking... Or they got 80, 84 on here. But wasn't 83 the big 3D horror kind of boom with Friday 13th Part 3 and Jaws 3 in 3D. And then we have Dimension... <laughs> Dimensionos Occultus, which is Cemetery of Terror, um, I believe, uh, if I'm not freaking mistaken. Oh, it's Don't Panic, not Cemetery of Terror. They already released that one. But this is Don't Panic. My, my bad. Um, this one I have not seen. Um, I have seen Cemetery of Terror. will like it quite a bit, um, at least in terms of style. I heard this movie is bonkers. So, uh, yeah, I know this one did some screenings, so look forward to checking that out too. If it was up to me, I'd just watch Vinegar Syndrome titles for the next month. Then we got Fade to Black. Oh, man, this is a really cool movie. It's been a long time since I've seen it. Uh, I, probably on DVD, probably VHS, maybe. Um, people used to laugh at Eric Bidford. Now, with every performance, he knocks him dead. Yeah. Uh, cool movie. Cool movie, Dennis Christopher. I remember Mickey Rourke has a little tiny role in here. But, um, yeah, can't go wrong with Fade to Black. Vinegar Syndrome is the company that is getting it done. So many people are like, we're not getting spookies. We're not getting Fade to Black. We got them. And they're going to get more. And it's going to be amazing. And um, I love that this company started off pretty fairly, fairly small, but now they are just releasing some of the hugest titles that we've wanted. And I know these aren't like the big titles, but they're releasing some really great stuff. Then we have Action USA from, uh, as, I, as I pull up Action USA, they're releasing some really great stuff. This is a VSA, um, fun kind of crappy action movie, I'm sure. I've not seen this one, but yeah. Uh, here we go. My The, the irony is not... Um, lost on me okay and then we have martial law is that ronnie cox on there no is that david carradine i can't tell if that's got to be david carradine um i've not seen this one and also martial law 2 undercover so very cool um yeah chad mcqueen what i gotta check if that is that's gotta be david carradine on that that's yeah probably is yeah, there he is. And he plays a character named Dalton Rhodes, not to be confused with Dustin or Dusty Rhodes. Right? Uh, there we go. And then we have uh, some Blu-rays. Lady Snowblood on Criterion. I've seen the first one. It's great. Never, never saw the second one, but I'll have to watch it. So, yeah, had to grab those. Then we have Rip Your Rips Your Nerves to Shreds, Evil in the Deep. I for some reason thought this was Evil Below. Um, this is from Dark Force. Grab this. They had a sale. But it's not Evil Below. It is uh, Evil in the Deep, which is a movie I'm not familiar with. Then we have Terror Express, which is an Italian uh, flick. I've always wanted to see it. 
Maybe I'll do a double feature with Night Train Murders and have a double uh, train tear. I won't be doing Horror Express because I've covered that one a couple times and I love it, but still. Um, train tear. Very good. Um, then we have, I mean, as in, I like horror train tear movies. Then we have this one, which I saw my boy Derek post about, and it just looked too cool to pass up. Howl from Beyond the Fog. And I know he's a big fan of it. Um, it looks like all like stop motion, like toy figure. It's, I don't know. It just looks like a weird kaiju movie. It looks very, very ambitious and really kind of lovely actually. So yeah. Then we have a couple more. Speaking of lovely, right? We have um, Truth or Dare Part 2, Wicked Games. And this is on Blu-ray, even though it's SOV. Now, I was curious if this is going to have both cuts on there. The regular cut and the snuff cut. Oh, we have original cut, snuff cut. Uh, so we got both cuts on here. Love that. Very cool in one place for once. Um, the snuff cut is actually really intense. Kind of surprised me. And then we have part three uh, of Truth or Dare, Screaming for Sanity, Truth or Dare 3. They were 10 bucks a pop. I was not going to po uh, pass those on. I'll uh, pass those up because we got my boy in here, um, Joel D. Winecoop. So, yeah. Then we got some more Blu-rays here. Tokyo Living Dead Idol. Not seen this. Um, looks cool. Her pop songs were her pop songs were always infectious. But now that she's been bitten by a zombie, she's about to set off a global pandemic. Love it. Uh, this looks cool, man. <laughs> Love it. Um, then we have Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf? Never seen it. I know, right? Um, I need to sit down and watch this in Sunset Boulevard. Um, I, those are two movies I've heard so many things about over the years that I haven't watched. And then we have Two on a Guillotine, another Warner Archive. Yeah, this is a lot of my Black Friday stuff coming in, guys. So if you're like, man, Mr. Park is ballin'. Um, I saved a lot of money for Black Friday this year, so... And I messed up the sound there, I'm sorry. Then we have Mystery of the Wax Museum. Heard about this one for years. Like I said, no bad wax horror films. So, yeah, going to check that one out, too. And then we have Performance by Nicholas Rogue, Mick Jagger, and Mick Jagger in Performance. Not seen this one. Um, I believe I've seen the trailer, but, yeah, interesting. Nicholas Rogue, I, the stuff I've seen has been good. And then we have Queen of Outer Space. Um, Sci-fi, looks cool. Zaza Gabor. Very cool stuff. A must for all B-movie fanatics. And then we have a couple DVDs that I could not pass up. We got the Rika Trilogy. These look uh, ridiculous. Exploitation Digital. These, this is a used copy. It's been out of print. All three movies are in here. Um, so, yeah. like the cover. like how they did that with them. Yeah, but... And last, I'm just going to show it. Detective Story. Um, Takashi Miike movie. Never seen it. Uh, pick this one up too. So that is a Tokyo shock. And I guess we're going back to the video, guys. Okay, guys. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Mm. Wait, don't you even think about skipping on that soy gravy. Name the movie.